everyone! Hey, Mike Phillips here. It is time for another episode of The Front. It's a live leadership lesson right now, and I've got a very special guest with me today. So right now, what I would like to do, first and foremost, just remind everybody that you can check out the website at leadtheteam.net for free sales training, for motivational content, and for leadership tips. And if you would, cruise on over to leadtheteam.tv, subscribe to the YouTube channel there, make sure you hit the little bell notification icon so you get notified every time that I go live and upload new episodes. So we're going to go ahead and get into the show right now, right after this. Thanks for tuning in to Lead the Teams, The Front. Yes, so we are live here on Live Leadership Lessons. My name is Mike Phillips and I will be your host and I am here with Miss Bobby Heron of the Bees Knees Agency. Bobby, how are you doing today? I am fantastic, Mike. That I am fantastic now that we've got this stream going. So this is kind of an experiment because Bobby and I are going live. We're on a couple different platforms. So whatever platform you're joining us on, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. And I'm going to dive right into some questions with Bobby. She is an absolutely awesome, awesome individual. She runs, she, uh, is it like president or queen bee? What is your title? President of World Domination is my official title. Okay. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, I struggled with the title, actually, because people said, oh, you're starting an agency. Are you the CEO? Are you the founder? Well, that feels kind of crazy in the beginning. I love president of world domination or dynamic change or student of the business. I don't really care what you call me as long as you call me. I, absolutely. And I, I've i called you a lot the last couple of days to get this set up. So what, I, what I'd like to do, and I always start this off, we want to keep it to about a 20, 30 minute episode. If it goes longer than that, that's uh, certainly cool because I know you have just a wealth of information and knowledge to share. But do me a favor, give us a brief history of who you are and then what you're doing now. What does the Bees Knees Agency do uh, other than world domination? <laughs> little history of who you are, how you came up. I know you're an automotive and then uh, where you're at right now. Yeah, for sure. So I started in automotive when I was 17 years old on accident, like most other people kind of tripped and fell into what was the beginning of Ford's BDC program in a dealership, printing out on the old school printers, with all the paper from service and sales customer names that had come in calling and checking on their experience. Uh, before internet leads were a thing. I don't even think I had a cell phone at the time. They might not even have been available at the time, maybe like a flip phone. But I right. spent uh, almost 20 years in automotive, 17 on the in straight dealership employed by a dealer or dealer group side. Started out, uh, like I said, working on some kind of BDC stuff as then a salesperson, a sales manager, a general sales manager, a general manager, a director of digital, a marketing director, a BDC director. Uh, I mean, you name it. I've swept floors. I've been a porter. I've done all of it. And I moved through the business not job jumping, which is something I'm really proud of, but instead moving up. And it was never because uh, I was amazing. It's because I really believe in great leadership and building amazing teams. And so I've promoted through the industry doing that. And three years ago, I exited being employed by a dealer. Like they wrote my check. I still work for them uh, right. this day. But I exited the dealership role while I was with Garber Automotive as, as an executive leader in their company, uh, overseeing all of the dealer operations across the country for 19 franchise stores, 32, I think that we have the time, B lots or independents as we call them, uh, in doing digital sales and marketing as the director for the company and moved into a role with uh, Zima Automotive to help build and oversee their consulting division, including the Cardinelli Auto Group, which is number one Ward Z dealer. Not to say that happened while I was there, but oh yeah, it's a. And so a uh, little over seven months ago, I launched my agency, which is marketing, training, and consulting. Uh, and we do across the board, jack of all trades, everything. I employ a amazing team that uh, is experts. I hate that word, right? They're experts, but it's right. the truth in each field right and so that's what i do i work on world domination with dealers every day and help them uh to make better marketing decisions to train at a higher quality and to consult on operations so that they're working on leadership and that we're building amazing teams across the board cool it's really fun. So, 
A- absolutely. So let me ask you, what is, because you, you have a bunch of different titles that you've had over time. What is the cool, now don't give me the world domination one. I know what you're going to try and say. What is, in, in all seriousness, what do you think is the coolest title that you've had in your time in automotive? Yeah. Uh, so not to sound cliche, but my best title has been a leader across the board in anything. My coolest job description, yes. what I've gotten an opportunity to do would be the uh, digital sales and marketing director position for Garber Automotive for such a massive group to okay. be able to to touch the hands and the lives of everybody in all of the dealerships across the country and be able to do so many things. I like to win and I like to help people win. I'm super competitive. I know so, that about you. I've learned that. Okay, so what if there was one thing that you would say of, of all the different people that you've worked with, and I know you've worked with some hitters, of all the people you've worked with, the people that you come in contact with, what would you say if there was one thing that Bobby Heron is known for, what would you say that one thing is? Uh, results. <laughs> I mean, obviously, but uh, known for, I think, uh, I think I'm known for fighting for the dealer. I think I'm known for, for reviewing things that, uh, need to be analyzed in operations overall, and then coming up with strategies that win and executing them. If you ask my friends, my colleagues or my peers, I think they would tell you it's buy-in. Okay. So buy-in would be the biggest, you, you said buy-in or what, what was the, you said one before that you said it was results, right? So results, results, results and buy-in, those two go hand in hand. That's a good, because if you get yeah. buy-in from people, you develop results in their facilities, in the dealership or in any business, right? So Right. Well, I mean, what, what happens a lot of times is, uh, is we look at something, right? So uh, especially in a dealership, this happens a lot. We'll promote somebody from within and we'll teach them how to, you know, think about a manager for a minute of a mm-hmm. desk. We'll teach them how to desk a deal. We'll teach them how to order cars from the OEM. We'll teach them how to sell back-end products, but we forget to teach them how to be a real leader with other people. And that means creating a real strategy with a real goal in mind, creating buy-in and getting results and celebrating the win together. And we forget those parts of it. And I love those parts of it. So when you're saying creating a real leader, if you're creating a leader, what what are what would you say are the top three characteristics? Three things that you say define leadership. If you're if if you have someone that is mentoring somebody else, and you say, "Hey, look, while you're mentoring this person, here are the one, two, three, maybe four things that you, they have got to develop so that they are in a leadership role and not just somebody who carries a title." Yeah, well. There's probably 20. I'll tell you the number one most important thing is that when we promote somebody to a leadership position, I don't care what business you work in, whether you clean floors, you're an aerospace engineer, you work in a dealership. The biggest thing that happens when you become a leader or a manager or a boss, whatever word it is that we're negative or positively connotating to is that you're no longer judged or your results are no longer based on you. Right. For our whole lives, we're taught from the minute that we enter school that not to think outside of the box, to follow the rule because somebody said so. Then we're taught to be able to win for ourselves. But nowhere, unless it's intentional, are we taught how to take a result that we're able to achieve and transition that into another person. Because now once you become a leader, your results don't matter anymore. The results of your team do. And people will work for you because you said so. And they'll do what you want them to do because you said so. But they won't do it at 100%. They will not give you their all unless they believe that you have genuine care and that you can inspire them. So I tell all new leaders, invest in yourself if your business isn't. And make sure you know how to transition that. Let go of control. That's number two. Let go of control. If you control everything that's happening, you're not going to be able to pass that on to somebody else. Everything that you know, there was a time when you didn't and you had to learn it and you got this good and your team, they can get this good too, but not if you're doing everything for them. Love them enough to hold them accountable. When you create a real strategy with a real goal, help them win and love them enough to hold them accountable. And the last thing I think for a leader, and there's a million, uh, and this one's a big one to me, learn how to coach or terminate somebody with grace. Stop. Yeah being disgraceful to people that you let go and instead know that 
if you're making a change in a position for somebody, whether it's their fault, your fault, or, or the world's fault, it doesn't matter. Set them up for success in the next position. They're full too. And I think that's important. No, absolutely. I think those are awesome. Sometimes I miss the trends. If anybody's watching out there, the only reason I miss the transitions because I always take notes. That's that is my ulterior motive as I interview awesome people like you, Bobby, is so that, you know, I'm I'm learning more about the psychology of leadership and people that have have come up also. And I I really do. I take notes and and then reblog it. So a couple of things that you hit on that I absolutely love, and I'm going to recap them. You you had said caring, genuine caring, I think is massive when it comes to leaders. If and they have it, they have to care about others, not themselves. Yeah. You know, so many people. I agree with you. I think they get into that leadership role and they think, well, now I have the title, so now it's like the golden ticket, right? And they think because I made the title, now you have to care about me. And they've got it backwards. Yep. And I think that's it's a really totally good backwards. statement. And I do think when too. When you're a leader, I'm when sorry. You're a go leader, ahead. You have to serve others. Yeah. When you're, I think I have just a little second delay. So apologize. No problem. When you're a leader, you have to serve other people, not yourself. When it's just about you, when when you're when you have a goal to hit, when it's your result, when it's your job, and you're thinking about how you can win, it's about you. And you're, it's all me, myself, and I. But when you have a team and you're a leader, when you're a true leader. You have to serve the people on your team in order for them to succeed, because ultimately that is the role that you've been placed into, into caring for a team of people, not into just some some number that you're trying to hit or some job that you want to pat on the back for. You don't get a pat on the back. Your team does. And you need to be the one giving it to them and then loving them enough to hold them accountable when they're not. Absolutely. That's awesome. The other thing that I really liked was when you said you got to let go of control. So many people, not just leaders, that, but they have a tough time with that. I know I have. I, I mean, if they had watched you and I interact or the texts between us, even right before this episode, it's hard to let go of control. And just it, it, my saying, I say, you know, let go and let God like you have faith and whatever's going to happen is going to happen. You said as we were coming on, you said, well, somebody's looking out for us. It's the Internet gods. It's the God, whatever it is. So I, I'm going to yeah. move. I'm going to move to a few leadership questions because you did an awesome job of promoting this event when we were talking about uh, doing this and going live together. And there were some specific, there were three or four questions that I picked from your fan base or your audience, whichever we'd like to to call them, that I want to ask because I think these were really good questions. Um, One of, and I'm not going to ask these necessarily in order. So, uh, but one of the questions that, someone asked, I think it was Andrea said, what is the right time to move out of a dealership and follow another passion? And I think that's a really good question to ask for you right now, because you are following your passion. So what, how, how do you gauge what's the right time to move out of a dealership, follow a pass, uh, a, a, a passion that somebody's got? So I, I always think this question is so interesting. Uh, and and I, I hear it a lot. And I'll tell you, for the people that are watching that, uh, you know, it was an easy decision for me. It wasn't. I, three years ago, wanted to jump out and do this on my own. And, and just like everybody else, I was like, man, I think it'll go great. I know it'll go good. But will I have all of the tools I need to help somebody else be successful in what I want to do? And ultimately, what I learned is to be a really good leader, you have to be willing to take a risk. So if you really look at what you're doing and it's for the right reasons, it's not because you just left a conference and you were inspired and uh, you feel like your store is unfair. It's not because you had a goal you couldn't hit, but you have a bunch of excuses and blame for other people. It's that you've actually really calculated the opportunity versus the risk. And for you, it's the right time. Timing is everything. Timing is 100% of everything. And if you look at it and go, it's worth the jump and I have the risk there, fly baby jump just make sure it's not going to come at the cost of your family i wanted to start much earlier and i was going through a divorce after being with my um my children's father for 17 years Mm -hmm. and i looked at it and went if i fail if i fail or if it takes longer for me to succeed then i believe that it will am i in a financial position to be able to securely help my family for at least 90 days and i went maybe not and i waited it didn't take me two years to get to 90 days, but by that time I realized maybe I wanted six months in my in my pocket before I had to worry about that. 
So calculating a financial risk, as well as the reality of, are you leaving for the right reasons? Even if you're going dealer to dealer, like you're moving from one dealership to the other, sure. is it that the grass looks greener on the other side because you didn't water it? Did somebody put some sod down and trick you? Like, do your research and don't make reactive decisions. Be proactive in major life decisions and you won't regret them. I think those are both really good pieces of advice. The financial portion, because I think that's something people don't truly consider. They say, hey, I'm passionate about this, so no matter what, it's gonna work. But I think the fact where you're sharing and you're saying, hey, no, I'm really slowing down and there is a financial aspect. I mean, it might be different if we were, you know, I know a lot of uh, the circle that you and I are in, so to speak, in automotive, we have, the, you know, there's what would be considered middle age, 30s, 40s, that you know, yeah. 50s. And so it's like you, you have to look at the financial part. It'd be different. Like if someone was asking and they said, hey, Bobby, I'm 19 years old and here's what I want to do. Well, I mean, pack your stuff. Everything you own can fit in the trunk, right? right. Um, but I, right. I, I think that's really valid. And then the, the grass is greener philosophy and i've heard that before and one of the interesting things and i've i've compared it to is it's like well you look on the other side you look over here and you go man it, it looks green and and everything looks fantastic yeah. and then all of a sudden you jump the fence and it's like oh it's fake grass what happened right, right? It's, not it's not real so it all of a sudden people people realize that it's like oh yeah it looks really good from afar but once you're in it and you have to worry about nurturing what is that lawn it's like well i, I don't even have to do anything it's going to sit there on its own and how much are yeah. you really growing through that so i'm just looking at a few uh, of of the comments uh matt raymond he says uh 30 is not middle-aged mike <laughs> i hey, listen I, I'm getting up there. I, I don't know. I'm considered middle-aged. So, Matt, we could debate that, right? Uh, Patrick says, taking a risk is totally different than making calculated choices. And I think that's mm -hmm. a really, really good point. I want to scroll up here. Uh, Dan says, Dan Moore says, the circle. Well, it, it is the circle. He, Dan that's Moore's in the circle. Of, yeah, Dan Moore's in the circle of trust for sure. So, um, oh, yeah. Patrick had a question on Facebook. He had said, what's the best strategy to get a one track minded general manager to open up and try new ideas and processes? Well, that's an excellent question because it's different for everybody. And uh, I know why Patrick asked this question, but what really happens is you have to create buying with somebody. When I said that, I really mean that people have to feel like something is not only their idea, but that it's solving a problem they have too often especially with a general manager, they've tried things. They say things like, um, you know, I've tried that. It didn't work. Or I guess I'm not sure why we're, we're not still doing that or I can't get somebody to do it. And the truth is people just want a solution to a problem that people will actually follow through with and do and get a result from. And so when I work with general managers, on creating buy-in. It's not just for them. It's for their team. It's understanding the motivation and the way that people think by behavior so that you can solve their actual problem instead of somebody else's. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. The so the I'm, I'm just going through these as we're coming. To the, we've had some technical difficulty, folks. And for the people that are staying with us, thank you so much. Uh, we're rocking through it. So I am going to ask. Uh, here's another one that was asked by Andrea says, I'm interested in hearing Bobby's thoughts on what the right time is to move out of a dealership. Oh, no, I already asked that one. I asked That's two questions. Else. Okay, so here's the last one. And that I pasted that one twice. Here's the last question I've got for you. Why do you believe, you Bobby Heron, believe that leaders require staff members to attend events for like self-improvement, product training, other information? Why do you believe that the people that are in, and I don't wanna say leaders, because in my mind, people that are leaders are not, participating in this but right. why do you believe people that are in a leadership role that have a leadership title are having their staff attend events and they are not immersed in those areas themselves so i think it's a couple of reasons but here's the main one we have a tendency as a society any industry but specifically it happens a lot in automotive to think that raising our hand and asking for assistance or training on something makes us weak 
or vulnerable. And that happens, especially in our industry, because we say things like that. People come to a desk and they ask a question. We create a joke about it. Oh, you don't know that? Or they come up and they, hey, how do you do this? Well, what does it matter? I don't know. We're raised in an industry where people think that actually saying, I want to learn and understand means that they are weak. The truth is you are weak when you do not raise your hand and say, I don't know. And leaders, not even leaders, bosses, owners, managers, employees who are not willing to invest in their own success or to become stronger in an area, do it because either they feel like it makes them weak or they think they're better at it than they are. And it's not easy to admit fault, right? It's why it's why when somebody comes in to buy a car at the dealership and we uh, we work the deal and then they leave, we say things like they're unrealistic. That's not apples to apples. Right. Well, the truth is you failed. You're not going to deliver 100% of the cars, but the truth is you failed. And failure is something that is very difficult for us to accept as human beings, especially when it's so much easier to make an excuse and have everybody around us make it okay. And not very many people are walking into the boss's office saying, unacceptable. Why aren't you attending this? How are you going to hold your people and yourself accountable for a result when you don't know what you're looking for? You can't inspect what you expect unless you participate in the strategy, the goal, and the execution for the intended result. And it's a shame, but that's often why. The other thing is people think, and I, and I love it when people say this. I say that very sarcastically. Bobby, I can't have three people out of the store to go to training. You can't afford not to. You're going to sell two cars that day. Maybe four, this is going to make it where you sell 10 more. You need to invest in the time. And most importantly, you need to empower the people that are working on your team and let go of control so that you can step out of a store and have some training, whether it's leadership, CRM, like it doesn't matter what it is, sales training. It, I absolutely will not take on a client for an, a sales effectiveness improvement or a training unless owner, the executive managers are willing to sit in the room, participate. I will cancel the training and walk out. And if that makes me not the right fit for you, you're not the right fit for me. If you're not going to lead by example, we're not the right team. That's a strong statement. You have to be and you have to be willing to hold true to those values. I think that's fantastic. Yep. So and that that also answers the second part of that question, because one of the questions that was asked or the, the tail end of that question was, well, why don't leaders allow their staff to go to those events? You know, vi the, the inverse of it. And I think you answered it really well is it's because, oh, well, we can't afford to, right? But I mean, you started off that way. So I am, I'm gonna move to my, my next question. I got two questions left for you and we're just gonna keep rolling. You're getting all kinds of love and stuff still on, on Facebook. I don't know if we're live on Facebook or not, but people are we certainly watching me. on both, on YouTube. So here we are. So uh, one of the questions I ask everybody that comes on my show and you've heard it asked on many shows, especially the leadership and kind of empowerment shows, self-help. If you could go back in time, Bobby, and you could tell your teenage self this one tidbit of information that would change the whole world. And I don't ask that question. <laughs> I was just teeing you up for it. I don't ask that question because we can't go back in time, but we can help improve the lives of the people that are watching this, that are following you, that are you know following my show and so forth. So what piece, one or two pieces of information of advice that you might have given yourself or something from now, moving forward, someone that wants to move into a leadership role, if you were gonna say, hey, you need to do this one thing or this two things, you know, what piece of advice would you give those people to To really, sorry, I transitioned that too quick. Uh, That's okay. To, to really uh, move forward in, in their leadership opportunity in their career. Yeah, so I'll give you two. One, listen to your mother. She's already done all this. She has the best intention. Stop That's rolling your strong. eyes. I have a teenage, so her too. Listen to your mom. That's important. She's on your side. Uh, but two is slow down. Don't take a job because it has a title that you want, that you're not ready for. Because not only will you fail, but even if you felt like you succeeded, you won't be able to give it to your best. Too often people say, oh my gosh, I got offered this job and here's the title and I'm, I, you know, I'm really thinking about taking it. And are you prepared for it? Because a fancy oftenness in a title doesn't make you qualified and it doesn't make you happy. You have to be ready for things. Slow down a little bit and be okay with saying no when the timing is wrong and jump when the timing is right. 
yeah, I think that's really important. So you would say, listen to mom and slow down. And those are probably both pieces of advice you give to your kids. Yes. <laughs> I met your son, what, two two weeks yes. ago? Was it two weeks ago? And uh, yeah, I could see ago. you giving him that advice. So uh, I'm going to ask this one. I'm going to ask this one of, of you also. Sometimes we don't make it to this part. Uh, passion is a big deal. And I know you've probably kind of touched on this and you've you've mentioned it kind of throughout out the show here and there. And so the it's okay if there's a little bit of a duplicate answer, but passion is a big deal in business. Passion is a big deal in life. Uh, and you hear people say, find your passion and you'll be successful. What, how would you suggest that somebody go in search of their passion? How can they start to find their passion right now? Yeah, so actually I love this question because a couple of years ago, maybe seven or eight years ago, I was looking at transitioning the position that I was in. And I had been talking to all these people and really considering it. And one very smart person told me something. She said, what do you want to do? And I said, everybody keeps asking me what I want to do. Tell me what the options are. I'll tell you if you want to do them. And she said, that's not the way this works. And I was like, how do you figure that out? And this is what I've followed since then. She said, I want you to go home and I want you to write down everything you would love to do in a week, not in a day, not in a month, in a week. What would what would make it worth it? What would make it worth the sacrifice? What would make you happy? What would make you challenge in the day? What do you want it to be? Make that list of things, look through it and start there. Cause that's how you find what you're passionate about. It's what makes me smile in a day? What makes it worth the 30 hours of work that, that I might end up doing? What makes it worth the result? What makes me feel challenged? And everybody is different. That's the starting point. It sounds so simple, but it's so effective. Mm -hmm. I want to, I want to win in a day. I want it to be competitive. I want to be able to help other people. That's the truth. I want to analyze things. I also want to use my charm and charisma because it's fun. I want to get paid to make friends. That's what I do. Get paid to make friends. People only want to be my friend when they win. So it's perfect. Absolutely. But that challenge really helped me figure out what, what I was passionate about because what it did is it made me start thinking about all the things that I had done that I loved and that I didn't love. And it made me start thinking about all the things that I thought that I wanted to potentially do. And if I would really enjoy them. And when I was done with that list, I went back to it the next day and I crossed off 50 things and added 10 more. And I did that every wow. day for a week. And at the end, this is my job. And I'm super passionate about it. And I'm extremely happy. And I have been for years and years. It's not, it's not new, but I had that list all the time. I still have the original list that I used. And I hired a life coach actually, when I went through my divorce and through a big job change with Garber. And when I lost a friend in hospice at that time, they say the, the biggest three things that can change you or put you off course are death, a change in your marital status or your home life and in your career. And I went, Ooh, I'm going to do all three of them in like a five week period. Awesome. Oh my gosh. Great idea, Bobby. <laughs> and I hired a life coach, Renee Stewart actually, who is incredible. And people can say, Oh, a life coach, that woman kept me grounded. And she made me go back to that list all the time. So I have the original, every update, it, it lives in a notebook. Uh, it's got stickers all over it. Cause that's just, I like motivational stuff and stickers are all over it, but it helped me find my passion. And most of the time when we don't know what it is, we stumble upon it on accident. So if you happen to be one of those lucky people that stumbles upon it on accident, recognize it when you feel it because it feels so good and you can't duplicate that. That's what it should be centered around and then create all the steps around there and follow that. That is awesome. That what a good way to take us out. Thank you so much, Bobby. I I really Thank I you. cannot say enough how much I appreciate you taking the time to visit with me and the people that are watching. We did have some people stay. I if you could see my room, I got like four screens all the way around so that I can check on who's watching <laughs> and what's going on. Uh Ryan Girardi says, "Hey, he's really glad your car's not moving." That was his biggest concern, you know, is that your car's right? not moving. Yeah, thankfully. We we couldn't even Ryan, That's we awesome. couldn't even get the stream to to be magical there for a little bit. She we could not have a car moving. And uh, so as we yeah. come to a close, Bobby, how can people get a hold of you? What's the best way for people to reach out and contact you if they just want to be a friend, if they want to hire you, if they want to do any of that? What's the best way for yeah. people to get a hold of you? So uh, you can be on my cell at 989-672-9945. The best way is going to be by text. When I'm in a dealership, I take everybody's phones away, including mine. And that's why I'm in the car right now. I just left a leadership class at a dealership that I've been working yes. with executive managers on. Yeah, that's what I've been doing all day. And so uh, 
you know, sometimes you got to balance and I like to wing it, but that's my cell phone number. <clears throat> my email is partner with Bobby at gmail.com. You can go on my Facebook page and add me. You can go on my business Facebook page. You can go on my Instagram or you know what, honestly, if you don't remember any of that, go ahead and just Google me. Cause my number has been public for 14 years and it is all over the place. Awesome. Well, thank you, Bobby. Again, I can't say thank you enough. I, I really appreciate you taking the time with me today. I really do. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and take us out now. So if you'll just uh, hang out for me for one second. All right. So everybody, that brings us to a close for another live leadership lesson. Or it's kind of like two in one because, you know, we did do two videos on this. So I appreciate you taking the time to join me. Do me a favor. And one of the things I always forget to ask at the beginning, if you're gaining something out of these episodes, give it a thumbs up. Share this video or videos on your social media because that is one way to get the word out about Bobby and share this wealth of knowledge. It's just so awesome. And I will tell you what, until we speak next, I hope you have an absolutely just fantastic day. We'll talk to you soon, everybody.